show. Sorry. Oh. Oh. Okay. So funny. Yeah. Your voice. Oh, am I really loud? Yeah. Oh. Oh, no, it's, for me. Oh. Ooh, that sounds bad. Oh. Can you hear us sound like this? Yeah, I hear you guys. You sound fine. What's the matter? Oh, no, we, we got to play this. <laughs> You sound like you're using, like you're a spy and you're using one of those voice things to change your voice. Oh, I must sound like... <laughs> it's quite amusing though, Lisa. Oh yeah, this is going in the video. <laughs> What's going on? Oh, there you go. There you go. Testing, one, two, better? three. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, we when we play this back, you're gonna really you're love gonna it. You're gonna love it. You became a main baritone. Oh, whatever you did is is better now. Yeah. I think what's happening is picking up some sort of feedback in the system. You're good now. I heard him. He sounds great. Okay. She said. She this said is so strange because I I literally did not touch anything. Yes, you did. The husbands yeah. always do. It's <laughs> it's Girl, Cheers. I like that you're drinking a beer. It's not any beer. Oh, it's yeah. a corona. It's corona. I feel bad that they've been losing business, so I'm trying to keep their business alive because it's not their fault. Oh, that's nice. How is corona losing business? Oh, so like Carrie, joke. help them up. <laughs> Carrie, are you that blonde? <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> okay, may I just ask you what is the name of the virus right now? Oh, people aren't drinking Corona because it's got the coronavirus? Yeah. That is the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. Because <laughs> that's the truth. Is that really oh, the truth? You, you have not so seen first, that. Yeah, I, at first, yes, I did hear about that. And I was like, wow, All okay. Was out Everything was yeah. sold out except Corona beer. You haven't seen that video out there? Like people saying, there's this one lady going on and on in her car, like, Corona. Don't drink Corona because it'll give you the coronavirus. <laughs> Girl, in my free time, I read medical reports. I am not reading about Corona. Uh, <laughs> don't, we, don't we just say a cheers to day? How many that cheers. we have been quarantined? Forever. What day second? are we on? Day Please 60 guess. or something? Day mm -hmm. 5,200. Say, yeah, right. <laughs> day 10,001. Yeah, we don't have a volleyball when you put you know, Wilson on it. I know. I know. Like on oh, Castaway I, I, when he's like, you know, like, remember on Castaway when he was like yep. marking the days and for like years and, and the volleyball oh, was I, on it. My manager called it Groundhog Day and I tell you that was the best description of it because every day just starts becoming the next. Yeah. So how you doing? How is Santa Fe? What yeah. What's it like being out there? Uh, yeah, I, I'm out here because I love it here. And it's my spiritual, like, zen, happy place. Nice. And, yeah, I mean, I was at home for six weeks in Baton Rouge. And the thing is, but I don't live there. Like, that's my mom's home. I'm always a visitor there. And then I'm usually on the road. So I felt kind of like I was intruding on her space. Mm. You know, and I'm trying to, um, I'm devoting a lot of time to working, alternative working. <laughs> alternative facts. That's a new term for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because, you know, I mean, what we've been doing all of our lives, all of our professional lives, and all of a sudden that's totally uprooted. And now we have to find a new way to find things to do and find ways to remain relevant and remain occupied and remain employed Yeah. in some fashion. And so that's what I've been trying to do. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go and rent a place in a place that I like. And it's quiet and it's relatively isolated. I don't see my neighbors. It's Great. Um, Lovely. So when I'm just enjoying myself here. Can I get in my car and come? Because I'm really tired of my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> you actually, excuse me, I feel really bad because this landlord that owns, um, there's a few little apartments here all next door to each other. And the landlord that um, usually charges about three times what she's charging me at the moment, because this is the high season in Santa Fe right, right now. But the opera got canceled just two yes. days ago. Yes. So everybody canceled all of their reservations. And so she actually asked me if I wanted to stay because I was going to leave June 1st. And she said, oh, if you want to stick around, my, my tenant for the month of July canceled and June. And I was like, oh, I think I'll stay. I don't mind if I do. Thank you. Yeah. 
I'm comfortable. Great. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to hang around. I'm going to go home for like a week and just check in with my family and everything and make sure everything's cool there. And then I'm going to come back and continue on because now I'm, I'm teaching master classes. That is my new right. lot in life. <laughs> Talk, to us about that. Talk to us about what you're doing. Yeah. So I started a zoom masterclass series for free, uh, for open to all. Um, and I've got a lot of young singers. I've got over 4,000 people signed up for it. Wow. And it has been a really amazing undertaking. I mean, it's just grown completely organically via basically social media and people talking about it to their friends. And it's got young singers. There's some young artists. There's some semi-professionals. There's some people who used to sing and then don't sing anymore, but they still kind of love opera and they keep their, you know, they keep their noses in the opera world a little bit. And, uh, and I've had, I've got everything from, you know, young, young teenagers in high school to, to people who are old enough to be my grandparents, <laughs> including my grandparents. My grandma watches all my videos. She sits there, she's so cute. She calls me like, right after and tells me everything she thinks about, everything she thought about the whole meeting. Oh no, do, do you get the thing like, you should do your hair differently. You should do uh, makeup differently. No, I got, I, so far I've only gotten my, her, she and my aunt watched it together and they had a whole argument about whether or not I should curse in the videos because mm. I use, I use a few, a few choice words, but it's never in an offensive way. It's always in a comic way because mm -hmm. it serves, it serves the comedy, I think. But she was like, I don't, my grandma doesn't like it when I curse, but please, my, we're from Cuba. My grandmother curses all the time. It's not like she doesn't curse. My grandma curses all the time, right. but I think she thinks, I don't know. It's okay. I'm not going to quit cursing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're doing it for free. It's your yes. choice. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, and it's donation based and I've gotten a lot of um, people who've signed up and who, you know, donated what they could. And some people donate every class. Some people just donate when they can. Some people don't donate at all, but really it doesn't, it was never about trying to make money. It was just about do, trying to find purpose, which is what I feel right. like I've been kind of missing for this whole thing time i kind of feel like my purpose has only ever been performing and singing and so having nothing to work on or practice or sing or perform and then having you know this unforeseeable kind of future about what's where where the opera world is heading is scary so i want to have purpose i want to mean something to somebody <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. all yeah are you singing i i know you're you probably demonstrate in your master classes but are you singing singing yeah, I am. I mean, not as much now because actually these classes have kind of taken on a life of their own and they do require a lot of work to prepare because I prepare not only like a lesson, like I write. So Sandra and I have a similar notebook, don't we? We have our we little spiral. Do. I don't have mine here with me right now. Actually, it was out in, in the living room oh. because preparing for our interview tomorrow. <laughs> oh, you've got another interview tomorrow scheduled. Oh, yeah, one every day, girl. Y'all are doing one every day. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me find, let me find it. Let me find some topics. Like, All right, All right, Gary. It's unbelievable. <laughs> well, how often do they have, how often do you actually release your? Every weekend. Yeah. We'll do like one or two a weekend. Okay. Actually, I think we've been doing two a weekend. We've been releasing. Yeah. And it's kind of based on, uh, you know, what's last week or sorry, this coming weekend, we have Susan Graham and it's a two parter because we had such a great time. We talked so long and I couldn't cut it down. It was awesome. It was just a blast. Oh. And then, um, and the next week we're going to do Anthony Freud. Then I, I wanted to go from a singer to a general director and then a manager. So next weekend's going to be Anthony Freud and a manager. And, um, and then I think I got to look at the schedule girl cause I can't remember past that. So I know you have to, I know. But you know what else? Beautiful. It we, we're, we're very fortunate right now in that there's a lot of people that are home and we have that luxury of being able to talk to them where normally it would take months and months to mm -hmm. even get them to be in mm -hmm. touch with them. So everybody has a story and we want to hear everybody's story, not just musicians, but other people. Our, you know? Yeah, we've reached out to outside of our, our world too, just to be, especially other artists that, you know, what's going on with you guys and things, things are opening up, but how does that, how do you feel about that? And mm -hmm. how do you feel even just going to a restaurant? I want to know that. Have you guys gone to a restaurant in Santa Fe yet? Have you gone out to eat? Nope. We've gone Have to the, my favorite coffee shop in the universe, Iconic Coffee Roasters. Oh yeah, that's so good. Name dropping them. Um, but yep. just for takeout, just to grab coffee and walk away, but that's it. I mean, we've never, and only one of us went in, not two of us. 
I'm wearing masks, you know, no, I mean, I'm not, no, I was never a restaurant, much of a restaurant person anyway. I've always been a person who cooked dinner and Steven and I cooked dinner together. It's actually something we do as a couple that we've always enjoyed. Okay. Um, but, but no, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't sit around in a group in a crowded group. I have not done that. I, even in the grocery store, like I try to avoid people. Right. If I see someone's in the aisle, I want to go in. I avoid them until they're, yeah. there's more space. What about, um, lately I've been reading um, articles about exercising outside, about running outside with masks and biking with masks. What, what do you have? Honestly, there's such a myriad of opinions about it. Yeah. And I will say, I'm asking you that because last weekend when we did go for a drive just to get out, um, I said, listen, I think we can get bikes and go biking. And I will happily wear my helmet and a mask and bike around everywhere just so I can be outside. Um, yeah, if you can breathe. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, do you, have you, I don't even know how that works with running. I can't not even either. In the first place, I'm not acclimated to the altitude yet. It takes two okay. weeks. Yeah. I've okay. really been here just barely under two weeks. So I'm still not hundred percent acclimated. Like I'm still getting nosebleeds, you know, uh, oh, yeah. stuff, dryness and all, but it'll go away. But cause I remember when I first, the first time I came here and I sang here, it took me like two weeks, two okay, solid yeah difficult before to really get so I I wouldn't I couldn't run I feel like I'm running with a mask on without a mask on but no we avoid people I mean we try there are people who I think if you're moving fast enough and you're not just standing around and you don't breathe in their direction right I try to, I try to do that but if I see like a family and like kids and stuff like that I try to we just you know go around mm-hmm. yeah. talk to us a, so, sorry talk to us a little bit about that because I know that you have had such a journey with mm-hmm. with weight loss and exercise and mm-hmm. your diet because you have a you two both have changed your diet yeah yeah so we've been following a vegan or i would say whole foods plant based is probably okay. a more appropriate term because vegan is is kind of a life full life commitment of everything not just diet but i but i'm a dietary vegan if you'd like to say that um for nine years and we've wow. never varied off of it not even for a snack never we wow. i feel wonderful steven feels wonderful we went vegetarian first for a year to kind of okay. get used to no meat then we cut dairy and replaced other things but if you if you think of it as you're always replacing things it's much easier than than cutting things out um and then steven and i started running together uh, a few years ago and we both run but i I lost, started to lose weight in my early twenties. I'm 36 now, but in my early twenties, I was, um, I was 210 pounds and popping out of a size 16. Mm-hmm. And I was, you know, I'm a young, I'm a lyric, light lyric soprano, lyric coloratura soprano. And when I first started um, training in the young artist program at the Met, um, one of the things that they told me was a concern <laughs> was that I, my appearance, um, needed work that I needed to lose weight. They were pretty direct about it. Um, but the thing is, look, I had been hearing it in college. I had been hearing it um, at every audition I'd ever done. If they gave me feedback, they would always say I was too fat. Um, I heard it from my doctors. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like, you know, people who, who are heavy, everybody tells them that. Like, it's not yeah. like people avoid telling you. People always like to remind you. So I was hearing it for years and years. And finally, I was like, well, I'm a young artist at the Met. I want to I want to succeed. I want to have as many opportunities as possible. So I started kind of working. I had a little cry first. I'm not gonna lie. I had a little breakdown first, but then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to do this. And I just started going to the gym five days a week. I just started going. I was like, I'll figure it out. I don't know. I'm gonna figure it out and watch some girl in the gym that looks good. I'm gonna follow her. And that's what I did. I found this girl. I stalked her out throughout the gym. And <laughs> She probably thought you were like, oh, who are you? <laughs> I no, she, I, she didn't. I, I tried to keep a, a social distance even then, you know, to yeah. keep her from worrying. But you know, um, and I, I lost weight. It took me five years to lose eighty pounds, and I've been That's maintaining it ever since. Yeah. Good for you. And do you find that that changed your voice? No, because it was, it was such a long and slow process. Like I felt like I was able to age into my voice as I lost weight. So it's like, it wasn't like, and I was still in my early twenties. Still in my, I lost weight 
from age 21 through 26. So my mm -hmm. voice was changing and figuring itself out anyway. And because I was at the young artist in the young artist program, I was training much more vigorously. My voice was developing uh, and I had a teacher to help me to guide me and everything. And so, no, it wasn't extreme and it was extreme in the sense that it wasn't extremely fast, but it yeah. was a lot. I mean, but actually I definitely feel that I'm a better singer, not because I lost weight, but because I, learn how to listen to my body more, which is something mm -hmm. you do when you adopt a healthier lifestyle, you become much more in touch with everything that goes in your body and everything that you output with your body, you know, and, and that's important. I think singers need that at any weight, honestly. It's very physical what we do. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, yeah. Carrie, Carrie and I, we both sing Tosca and Barbia, yeah, and jumping. At the end of Tosca, right, Carrie? I mean, mm, how many sopranos you hear kill them, kill themselves literally, you know, hurt themselves jumping. Oh, so yeah. it's it's a very physical thing that we do. Yes. And I think people don't realize that also with the, with our breath expansion and the work into the back and running around stage, mm -hmm. we are athletes. And so to to take that aspect and to be very serious like you were with it, bravo. I mean, seriously. Oh, thanks. I just feel like, I don't know, now that I've, that my lifestyle is different, the only thing that I have definitely learned, which is kind of a sad lesson, but it's a truth, is that no matter what size you are, there's somebody who has a problem with your size yep. <laughs> or with your body. You're always too fat for somebody and too skinny for somebody else. So yep. it's just like, you know what, I, I'm glad that I lost weight. It's not just that I lost weight. I'm glad that I adopted a healthy lifestyle that mm -hmm. I can keep consistently but I've realized throughout the process that being skinnier does not mean that everyone suddenly approves of you. That, <laughs> that if you do it to seek approval, you will be disappointed. So I, I try to tell people that I'm like, you know, don't lose weight for anybody, but you, otherwise you'll be disappointed. Yeah. No. And you also come to that weight loss. I think when, when I did adopted my whole lifestyle change too, right before the three Queens, I came to that on my own because people had said to me, you are overweight, blah, blah, blah. You need to do this. And I said, yeah, yeah. Okay. Whatever. But until you and your head go, okay, I'm ready for that. Yeah. I, I think it's pointless because you have to accept that change. I agree a hundred percent. Well, 100%. Right, Carrie? I mean, what do you feel about it? Because Carrie's on, has been on that journey in the last I, few I years. I mean, I have been every size in the book. I've been a size six, which at that, at that point was probably a size four. And I remember like my best friend said, no more. Like I actually, she said, you look like a bobblehead. Like I had gotten really too thin. And then, <laughs> and then I've, I've been a size uh, 22 was the size of my wedding dress. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I go up and down and, and in my career, it, the question has been, what does she look like now? Because for me, when you see me heavy and shit has hit the fan, it means my life, my personal life, there's stuff going on that is so heavy and intense. I don't know how else to deal with it. It's how I dealt with, with stress. And then I, it was a vicious cycle because I would eat and then I'd beat myself up in the gym. And I didn't know how to get off that train. And then when I hurt myself really badly, an, an angle injury, so compounding the stress of work, of trying to work through all that, along with other personal stuff that was going on, I mean, the weight creeped up. I remember, I think I hit on a Belena with Sandra and, and it was like, I, I was like, I can't, like I was so heavy and so uncomfortable in my own skin. And then having to get, wear these tw over 20 pound costumes, oh, I couldn't yeah. do what I needed to yeah. do. And I was still hurting. I was still actually rehabbing my ankle at that point. Oh. Um, and the thing is, is that you can't act like that. You have to walk in a room. Like you feel like you're a million bucks. You can't show that you are having a really hard time. And, and throughout the business, it was just that question of, you know, oh, she has such a, oh, I've heard this my whole life. Oh, she has such a beautiful face. Why can't she figure out Oh, my favorite was um, somebody said, listen, I mean, if you lost 20 pounds, I mean, that's all you need is 20 pounds. And then I'd go eat a package of Oreos because I was so upset that somebody told me I wasn't enough as I was. Yeah. And I mean, this is a very emotional time now too. And mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of not just singers, but people out there are, are dealing with emotional eating and, and sitting at home being sedentary. Oh my can't gosh. Even get out of their homes. It's like everybody's going to gain weight unless they, unless they physically consciously try not to. Right. I, 
I've gained a few pounds through the quarantine and I've had to like, and, and it's, the thing is that, and that's not like I'm ashamed of, oh, I gained 10 pounds. It's just that it triggers old demons yes. for me because I don't want to go back to that old person and feel that way I used to feel when I hated my body and I thought I was fat and I thought I was ugly and I couldn't fit into my clothes and I thought people were staring. All those things that I used to feel, right? they're always still going to be with you. They're scars, they're emotional scars that you carry forever, no matter how fabulous, no matter how many marathons I've run or how many, you know, right. how fit and fierce I've felt, I, I always feel like still it's there's always the potential that you can go back it's kind of like addiction yeah when you yeah, you never cured it's like you can always still that's why alcoholics if they want to quit yeah. alcohol they have to not even have one drink right because well, what know, i find um what i find though as i've gotten older and a little wiser about my body and what works and and that i am enough no matter what size i put on my body or what size the clothes say is that um what i'm learning to embrace is that um yeah my thighs have touched since i've come out of the womb but you want to know how strong those thick juicy thighs are let me tell you I mean, they are beasts and they're fierce and when i'm on a spin bike and i can spin as fast and as hard as I do on that, like it makes me so happy that I'm that strong and that my blood work is beautiful. And so my heart's healthy. I have great, you know what I mean? When you look at all the medical stuff and that I'm healthy, then I don't really care if you give me a hard time that I'm a size 12, you know, like you can suck it. <laughs> Speaking well, of watching language on, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. What fuck motherfucker <laughs> shit? <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, I mean, I, I had, when I was in college, I had, I was anorexic and bulimic. I was both of them. You struggled with an eating disorder, Sandra. I did. And I, you know what, quite, I, I've never told this to anybody. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying this now. But I actually went into hospital my, right before Christmas, because my father died. Oh. When my father died, I started starving myself because I thought, he died of a heart attack, and, and then I was diagnosed with a prolapse mitral valve, you know, so that you get this irregular beat. And I thought, oh, at my 17 years old, I said, oh my God, I'm gonna die. So I stopped eating, and because uh, I was overweight. I mean, like Carrie and I, that's why we're friends, because we're, our life paths have been so similar. Mm -hmm. I was born a size 12, you know, and, and by the time I was a junior in high school, I was already a size 14. Mm -hmm. So I, then I started running and running and exercising and I got so thin. Then I, then I, you hit that plateau. And so I started growing up when I went to college mm -hmm. and it's always, once you have an eating disorder and nobody talks about it, Thank but God. once you have that in your brain, that mentality that, oh my God, I, I gained five pounds. How am I going to lose it? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go and starve myself again. And so you have to, I'm sure you've had to reprogram your brain. I mean, Sandra, I, I, yeah. I'm just so heartbroken because I had no idea. You know, I, I don't, I have struggled. I, my eating disorder has never been that I've starved myself. My eating disorder has always been that I can't stop eating <laughs> that I, I, I felt like, you know, that's my disorder. Like if I could call it one, it's that I don't, I, I cannot stop. Once I start, especially if it's something that I like and something that's good, like I can't practice moderation. And I've had to accept that about myself because yeah. it's something that I'm not proud of. I wish I could just, you know, when people say, well, just eat, you know, just don't eat sugar, sugary yeah. things every day. Just don't eat a whole thing. Just eat one slice of pizza. Just have one, you know, helping of ice cream. And I, I can't do that. I, once I start, yeah. it's until I'm, I'll eat till I throw up <laughs> and, and, you know, and then it's just, and, it, and I don't know if it's emotional. I don't know if it's just sheer gluttony. I don't know if it's, no, it's I honestly believe, and this is what all the therapists that I went to, because you know, when you, when you end up in, in the hospital, then you start seeing all the people and, and then they're like, okay, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. So they said to me, a lot of people said, oh yeah, it's all your fault. It's your fault. But one, one doctor said to me, it's the way that you're wired in your brain. Mm -hmm. And and my little pea-sized brain said, I get that. Wow. You can't really help it. You can never change that wiring, but you can change the way you think. Mm -hmm. And that for me was like the ding, you know, that bubble over the head, like, ah, the aha moment. And that was how 
I got out of it slowly but surely and 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 acknowledging and understanding what your issue is and I said oh my gosh I sound like a <laughs> like no, I mean, but that's an important, I don't, I think eating disorders are way more common than we give them credit for. Oh, sure. I, mean, I, yeah. I, I've known girls who had them and who struggle yeah. with them and you never, they never tell you, like, you don't find out, you find, people find out when it's either too late or people find out because they suspect something and then their close friends might say something. But, you know, I, I, I think the pressure to be not just thin, but to be pretty, at least what you consider the closest to pretty, closer to pretty that you can get is very real in this business. I was and just gonna say that, that's where I wanted to, to go. Yeah. There's well, a lot of pressure on us. Oh yeah, especially if you're playing, if you're a soprano. I mean, when you play a leading role of a character that's supposed to be beautiful because they're described as beautiful in the opera all the time. And when you look around at the market, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we are, we are commodities. If you look around at the market and you see where this, where the, um, the hot commodities are, you know, looks and packaging is always a part of the product. It, it's, you can, and that's one of the things that it's a delicate subject because you don't want to say something to a young singer when they're vulnerable, that's going to trigger them to make a decision that's going to be unhealthy, which right. is what I want. I wish that could be avoided because I didn't feel like the way it was communicated, communicated to me was a fair and healthy way to communicate it. But the thing is that if I had been any other type of person, I might have interpreted it in an unhealthy way and started to doing unhealthy things like starving right. myself, like, right. you know, Sorry. whatever. And I did lose weight rather quickly, at least at first. Mm -hmm. But then, um, and when I came back the second year in the Young Artist Program, they were so impressed. I had lost like 20 pounds, which when you're really heavy, 20 pounds is not really that much. Um, but, and they were like, oh my God, we're so proud of you. You're so awesome. You know, you're going to be yeah. the poster child for weight loss now. And it was just, ever since then, I kind of became the poster child for weight loss, you That's know? Cool. And yeah, I mean, the weird thing is that then they would start kind of like, I had heard stories about how other singers would then get compared to me in the sense that Lisette lost weight. Why can't you? And that, mm -hmm. and then I kind of would like, by no actions of my own and by no fault of my own became what other people saw as an enemy or what other people might've seen as, you know, resentment. They would uh -huh. resent yep. because of it, because, uh, because their managers would sit down with them and have the little heart to heart and yep. say, well, let's settle a PESA, you know, and it gets, I still hear about that to this day. Wow. And I really, really wish to God that that was not the case. But the fact that again, as I mentioned, the market and the commodities, that's why that exists. That's why that happens. You want to be known as Lisa, the opera singer, Basta. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. for most for most of my career, at least the the bit that's been um, the upward trajectory part of my career, that part of my life was quite far behind me. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people didn't even know that I used to be overweight. In fact, um, just just past year when we were in Paris, Sandra and I was singing Rosina, right? I had posted an old picture of myself in college when I sang the role of Rosina, and I was nineteen, and I was like n unrecognizable. And I posted the picture. It did not cross my mind. I swear it did not cross my mind that I was twice the size that I am now in the photo. I just posted a young picture of myself. Yeah. And every single comment was like, I can't believe you used to be fat. I can't believe you posted this picture of yourself fat. I can't believe that you lost all that weight. It was mostly positive, but it was just like, yeah. oh my God, I can't. And I can't believe you have the courage of posting yourself, posting a fat picture of yourself. And I'm like, courage? That's Why just me. Not? Why should I not do that? Why should I be ashamed? Like, I don't... <laughs> But they thought I was posting it to show that I had lost weight. I wasn't. I was just posting it to show that I found an old photo of me when I sang Rosina, you know, when I was young. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. kind of like, yeah. but weight means so many things to so many people. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I know. I, and I, I didn't want to get off on this tangent, but I know that it, for a lot of singers, it's, it's very important. And it might be even more important or let, who knows in the future of opera now, when there's going to be maybe potentially less and less jobs. I think we should talk about that Nats report. Oh yeah. Because we would love to know your opinion about that. Cause that, that was a really bad day for both of us when that came out. I did not watch the webinar, but I read um, yeah. Zach Finkelstein's article yeah. about it. And the thing is that I went to the YouTube video of the webinar this morning and I read all the comments. I do read comments. That's like a bad habit, but I do because it, I like. You know what though? Take. It's it, it, you can find out how people are feeling and and exactly. Yeah, and a lot of people were like, 
I don't understand why there are so many ifs and ands and maybes and could be and might could be. Everything is kind of like, nothing is like a really, like a definite statement. And it's like, well, it's because science is not really as definite as it is. We haven't had enough time to study Corona. No. So I can understand that there are still some like, you know, uncertainties about things, but the fact to be, to say that we can't sing in ensembles until there's a vaccine and that that could be two years out. That I find a little, um, um, <laughs> what <laughs> that was no i mean i'm when i read that part of that of the gnats i wanted to uh, crawl in my bed and not come out <laughs> oh my god and eat nachos all day praise jesus then what are we supposed mm -hmm. to do like first of all my first think it my first think my first think on this is um so how am i supposed to support myself in a, when I have spent, you know, or any of us, how are we supposed to support ourselves? If we've been full-time musicians for the better part of our professional lives, we have to suddenly just find another line of work. Do we give up on music or do we wait two years and come back to music? I mean, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, is this just an interruption or is this a, if you can't wait two years, get out. You know, that's what I don't, I'm like. You and know. also, I mean, people's voices change in two years, right? I mean, I'm 51, I'm through menopause. My voice is not going to be the same in two years, mm. you know? And you're younger, but your voice is probably going to start to change and, and mature and, and grow. Absolutely. So if you say yes to a role two years, three years from now, who knows if- Who knows? If it's still going to be within my realm of capability, especially if I haven't had solid work for two yes. years. Just out how, I mean, my voice is yeah. all out of shape in, with a month or a couple right. months of not singing, but that's only because I've been singing for, for so many years. But right. if you if you wait a year, two years without regular you know, working of the voice. I, I think about dancers as well. I don't even know how the hell dancers are keeping in shape now. Dancers work I don't know. Eight, six hours a day. I know. But, you know how, what are they doing? Know. Leaping around their houses? Like, I, I just Doing like, classes, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm glad, I, I'm glad I'm not a dancer. But yeah. it's hard enough to even just be a singer. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the kids in my classes are telling me I can't even sing in my apartment because oh. it disturbs my neighbors and, and yeah. I want to practice. And one girl was like, I'm so desperate. I don't know what to do because she's like, they keep my, she lives with people and she's like, they keep telling me it's okay, but I know it's not. And I feel really guilty. And I was like, do you have a car? And yeah. she said, yes. I said, sing in your car, mm -hmm. get in your car. Oh, and you, know, okay. and mm -hmm. you know, you're right. And I have a lot of, a lot of young artists writing me also, not just about that aspect, but writing me and saying, I am struggling to find motivation because I am on the food chain, right? As we, as we call it. Yes. We're, we're all three of us are very lucky in that we have had great careers, but these people are just at the entry level. Mm -hmm. If, if not even there, you know, they're still in high school, college. Mm -hmm. And they say, we, we're struggling to see what our future is going to be. Right. If there is even any future, how do we keep hope? What should we do? Exactly. Which houses are going to survive? Are houses going to shut down? Opera houses, are they going to, you know, continue to? I mean, what happens if the Met can't open next season? Because it can't. Because Unprecedented. It can't. And if the Met doesn't, is that going to set the precedent, the precedent for the rest of the opera houses around the world? Because if they yeah. can't, and you know, we've been, Carrie and I, we've been very fortunate to get a lot of great interviews with a lot of great people so far. Yeah. Of heads of opera too. houses. And, and they're all, including you. Yay. Thank and, you. And, you know, they're all, they're all saying the same thing. We, we, because Carrie and I ask what, what's going to happen in the fall? What's going to be the next opera? What's, and they all say, we, we don't know. And so many people are speculating because there's just too many variables. Yes. Mm -hmm. It changes day to day, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Like my fear. So like I had my Traviata canceled in May in Spain. And so mm -hmm. they wrote and they were like, well, we're going to try to do it in July. And I was like, okay, well, there's, okay, there's some hope to a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And then I'm thinking to myself, okay, let's say everything reopens. I'm seeing all this literature, <laughs> all these news, all these articles saying, if things reopen, it's just going to make a second wave that's even worse. Like, mm -hmm. 
and it's so reopening is just really dangerous and you really can't reopen. And so I'm thinking, okay, do I know, do I think I want to risk it? Let's say they do decide to go on in June. Do I want to, or July, do I want to risk getting on a plane, going all the way over there, sitting in quarantine for two weeks. And all of a sudden there's another huge influx of cases and everything shuts down again and be further up shit Creek. Excuse me for saying, but I mean, I'm just like, that's the TV show. Make a decision. I know. And, and, and Carrie and I, we, we go back and forth. Somebody asked us in an interview, what would it take you to get back into an opera house? Hmm. And it's like, well, do we have an answer? And Carrie and I both said, I don't know. There's so many factors that go into that. Are we talking, are we bringing in the chorus? Are we, how, where's the orchestra going to be? How are you going to do costuming and makeup and wigs? Am I going to do my own makeup and wigs because I feel more comfortable doing that myself? Mm -hmm. um, are, are you going to quarantine our butts for two weeks before we have to come in here? And then what are the cleaning? The, yeah, the questions for even that. I mean, are we all going to be going grocery shopping or somebody bringing us food? I mean, there's all of these different factors that go into this. And then are you going to test everybody? Because I don't know if I want to sing next to Sandra if she hasn't been tested. <laughs> I took a shower today, Carrie. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. It's, sorry. It's late in the day, people. But I mean, yeah, I, just, I know. But there's part of me that... I, we need a little humor in this, but um, there's yeah, part of I'm me that's sorry. just like, I don't know. I would prefer testing. Can we test everybody and let's know where we're, where we're all at? So, is that going to be the magic answer either? We don't know. I know. But okay, so then my question for you, Lisette, and this might be opening a huge can of worms, but where are, <laughs> I know, wait, yes, that, that deserves a drink. Okay, I'm ready. Hey, ladies. <laughs> Where are we? Where are unions protecting us during all of this? And you don't have to go there if you don't want to. No. Oh, well, I, I have one comment that I can make. And I feel like the big issue with all of this is that the union can only behave, seemingly can only behave in a reactive manner rather than a preventative manner. Mm. With every issue I've ever had as a soloist, I've had, if I've ever been able to go to anyone or, or figure out how to get something resolved. It was always resolution after the matter was finished rather mm -hmm. than, Hey, can we prevent this for the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Protection. Who's protecting us? Exactly. And actually um, the rewriting of a lot of collective bargaining agreements is supposed to be happening this year. And I got an email this morning mm -hmm. from AGMA uh, about the Washington national opera mm -hmm. saying, because they sent an email to anyone who had worked there, I think in the past, three no. years or anyone who had a contract okay. in the next year. And no. it basically said, we're not going to re-bargain this year. We're going to leave the collective bargaining agreement as is because of the way things are. We can't just sit down and bargain. Yes or no. Vote yes or no. And I'm like, in the first place, <sighs> if we leave things as you is, then we're back to you know, then how are we supposed to make improvements? Because the soloists certainly would like to see some improvements in collective bargaining agreements because we've been hit with force majeure and all kinds and, and direct dealing and all kinds of issues that we're not supposed to be dealing with throughout this process. And now they're saying, oh, because of this process, we can't continue to bargain further. At least that's what I interpreted from this email. So I'm a bit um, not, I, I don't have a lot of hope. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of hope in the fact that it, or in the idea that this is going to turn out better for soloists that we'll be able to bargain for better deals for soloists because if opera houses don't have money to pay us now they won't have money to pay us next year they won't have money to pay us the year after if, certainly if they're not opening mm -hmm. so we can't effectively bargain for anything better yeah at, and every you know what i mean everyone yeah. needs protection i think people going back to a nine to five job want the reassurance that mm -hmm. they're going to be protective and safe when mm -hmm. they go back to work. Correct. Everyone wants that right now. And I think that's the biggest fear is, is seeing things opening up more there for you to, in the United States, things are pretty much opened up. Mm -hmm. How are we gonna stay safe? Yeah. And I think we, as artists, as solo, solo singers, we wanna know how are we gonna stay safe as well? Mm -hmm. And how is the opera house going to protect us? And exactly. these are all questions that I think have to be answered mm -hmm. before we return. And yes. 
I think one of the main issues, at least for a lot of soloists, is that we don't have a proper pay structure that's in right. any way secure. Whereas, because we're not employees, like the chorus is, and the people who are there at one opera house full time, they have a W-2, they have health care, they yeah. often have, you know, a week-to-week -week paycheck, whereas we show up, if we're lucky and we sing in a house that pays a rehearsal fee, we get a rehearsal fee. But if we don't sing a performance, we lose those fees, as you guys very well know. So the right. issue a lot of soloists are having is, can AGMA negotiate more secure pay structure for us in the future so that we don't show up at a gig, rehearse for two months, get force majeure called on us and get zero because right. that's what it, especially if it's force majeure that is worldwide right because then not right. only do we not have health care which i'm sorry but we should have it we're the ones that have it sing or don't get paid okay we should have health care we don't have that not only do we not have that or any kind of benefit plan whatsoever we have a retirement plan that some opera houses contribute to do <laughs> agma not all so we don't even have much of that. Um, and then we have no, no security whatsoever. If something gets canceled on force majeure, we don't get a percentage. And AGMA has basically been going house to house. There are, I think, 60 some odd signatories, AGMA signatories in the United States, and they mm -hmm. all function completely differently. They all yeah. have their own collective well, bargaining that's, agreement. Yeah. That's the problem. There's no unification. No, and no, not just no. in the United States, not just in North America, I think worldwide. Yes. And that might be something that people don't know is that each opera house that we go to worldwide, not just in the United States, but worldwide, each opera house has different rules, right. different governing laws. And we're just opera singers. I mean, <laughs> it, we, we like to sing. It is our passion and our talent. We, are, we don't have law degrees. We don't have all of this knowledge. Right. And oftentimes, you know, bad things happen. Right. My thing with AGMA was that it's because we travel so much mm -hmm. that I feel like over even just the last 10 years alone that everything, I have lost so many things from the collective bargaining agreements because yeah. we haven't been at the table or have been even wanted at the table. And they mm -hmm. say, oh, well, we, we send you things in the mail. And I'm like, you're kidding me, right? Because I've been on the road for six months, like I'm getting my mail or I'm seeing that. And it took so long for them to put something on email. I mean, it was like we, we were in the stone ages for the last 10 years with yes. us. That is 100% so, true. So the rest of everything. Yeah. And so a lot of there, uh, there's a lot of board confidentiality, to be honest, as well. Mm -hmm. On top of that, there are a lot of things that AGMA specifically mm -hmm. does not share with its with its membership. And I feel like that's another issue is that not only are we, we don't, we don't always get the mails, uh, you know, and even if everything was via email, like what I got with this Washington National Opera, right. thing today, they didn't attach the collective bargaining agreement. No. They just said, let us know if you want to keep things the way it is. And I'm like, right. Why, well, where's the CBA? I can, could I read it? You know, you have to like yeah. go out of your way to find it. Right. And well, that's, that's maybe with this pandemic now, that's a bright spot maybe it's a positive in that we're all going to discuss things and come to a worldwide agreement. Maybe that would be an industry to... standard. An industry standard yeah. would be, would be a, would be a welcome change because I but feel like we have industry standards when it comes to agents and how much we pay. And other walks of life. I mean, other people's jobs. Yes. If, if you look at other jobs worldwide, the auto union, all of these things, it's mm -hmm. pretty standardized. So right. I don't see why the music business can't be as well. And this is our time to maybe stand up and make a point. Well, and it, might, it might bring a lot of inequalities to light. Yeah. Won't it? Because then we'll find out that there aren't necessarily fair, fair pay practices. There aren't necessarily, you know, there aren't, there isn't necessarily an even pay structure. There yeah. isn't, you know what I'm saying? Nothing, yeah. nothing is as it appears even on paper. Yeah. I found that out and I feel like there's a good, uh, there's, and, and every country operates differently. Every country yeah. pays differently. You know, some countries mm -hmm. have, um, have sustenance from the government. They have, uh, yeah. what's it called the word when they get subsidies, some countries yeah. have subsidies and America doesn't subsidize the arts mm -hmm. and it certainly isn't going to subsidize them much under this administration. So it's kind of like, yeah, that right. how can we really so be on the same plane? So what have you learned about yourself during these months that you've been quarantined? Uh, <laughs> I feel the same way. I know, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it, it's, it's good. I think it's a very reflective time and I think it's good for us to take that time. 
Yeah. You know, Sandra, you've said that you've had a lot of reflection and we haven't even talked about this on our own, but um, I was just wondering what has changed for you? Because I feel like there's been significant changes for you, but I don't really know what those are. Do you want to tell them? Do you want to talk about that? No, it, I, I've, had, I've had huge, for me, it's been a time, I've been on this merry-go-round of a career and it has been a merry-go-round because I hit the ground running once I started at the Met as a young artist, like Lee said. Um, and it, I've been just going, 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 going for 25, 26 years. Yeah. So this was honestly the first time in my whole career that I've stopped and kind of taken stock of where I am and what I've done. And I think it's very important for people to do that and to say, you know, I'm so, A, so fortunate for what I've achieved in my career and been given the opportunity to achieve, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important to do that. And I've also realized that as much as I love what I do, and I love singing, I, I, I adore it. It, is, it, is my, it has been my whole life. It's my gift that I've been given. I'm okay at this point in my life to, if I have to, step away from it. And that it, it's almost like a divorce, you know, and, it, and I've mourned the possible loss of that career. And I don't know what, if, what have you two both gone through? I, I don't want you to quit. Don't get a divorce. <laughs> hey, listen, I don't want a divorce either, but oh, no, little, my heart will break. I, you're Norma. I mean, just watching your Norma um, oh, oh, on the, on the live streams. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a live stream. I guess it was, a, but it was like a live yeah, the HD. Like every, yeah, the HD, exactly. And then watching it on replay on the Met website. But it's a time for reflection and, re and, and adjustment. And yeah. Adjustment. That's absolutely, that's a great word for it, for this time. It's a time it of adjustment. And, you know, I, one of the things I taught the, or I wanted to talk about in my classes was, you know, to, to be successful in this business, one, well, and it became, because it came about because of a question that one girl asked me. She said, what kind of personality do you really need to succeed as an mm. opportunity? Like, what personality type should you be? And I said, you need to be the kind of person who can accept change. You can just be yourself, change. too, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, too. I mean, that is, there are a ton of things that I think could contribute yeah. to success in any, in, any, in any field. And certainly, you know, being authentic as an artist yeah. is, like, it's so key, but you know, but we could just think of like, if, if you, if you as a human being, if you as Sandra or you as Carrie are the type of person that says, I change makes me sick to my stomach. I cannot deal with it because I, all I ever do constantly, my entire life is adjustment to change. But yeah. at least for a while that became a routine. Now mm -hmm. it's like adjustment to change plus no routine. Like it's <laughs> all, everything is just day by day sure. figure it out and i'm afraid because i don't have a steady stream of income to support the willy-nilly life of well okay let's just see what happens next week well that's all fine if you're sure that you have everything that you need to meet to pay your bills to make right. it you know, rather just in case you know but then if they say you know and i and i'm a person who's been very careful with their money i have a savings account i have a home I have a retirement account of my own. I've, Stephen and I have been very careful and I've made strong choices about what to do in my life and what not to do in my life so that I can save money because I don't know. I always thought I should save in case there's a year that I can't sing. Like for years, I was, me and Stephen and I would say that wow. we need to save up just in case I have a vocal crisis and I have to take a year off of singing. Mm -hmm. That is going to be like my purpose for saving and putting away money. Not for retirement, for my vocal crisis. <laughs> <laughs> been there, done that. It's scary. And I'm sitting here like, I'm not crushing in on my vocal crisis money. I have yet to have, <laughs> I have, yet to have my vocal crisis and I am not going to cash in on my vocal crisis money that I work my butt off to put away <laughs> right now or even have to mortgage. I'm, a, you know, so I'm, I hate to make things about, about economics, but I'm sorry for well, not just the, the pain of losing an, of losing an opportunity to perform, but it's the fear of going, how long do I have to make this last? Like, how long do I have to hold out? Totally. Carrie, yeah, you know, she's there. <clears throat> I'm there and, I, and I'm, I'm that girl that thinks, you know, five months out, eight months out, a year out, I, I'm a planner. And, um, and I'm kind of always trying to look around that corner and say, okay, where are we going? What's happening? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's part of me that's actually thought, okay, I've been very fortunate to have women in my life that have reinvented, the, reinvented themselves older than what I am now, but 
they just said, I'm done. I'm going to do something else. And they did it and they were fabulous. And so there's a part of me that's thought, okay, well, if we're going to reinvent myself, what are we going to do? You what know? exactly will that be? Exactly. And if you had to reinvent yourself tomorrow, Sandra, like, let's say you decided, okay, I'm giving up. I'm not going to sing anymore. I'm going to go ahead and just bow out gracefully and leave while I'm on top. Yeah. and not go back into not think not wait for for music to catch back up what have you thought okay i'm gonna open a restaurant or i'm gonna i'm gonna start a, a practice of some kind like what do you have a alternate i have i have a few ideas i mean this being one of them what we're doing right now because my, as my mom said i was born with my mouth open and i never shut it since <laughs> <laughs> you know, thanks mom um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I, I think I'm a communicator and seriously, this has, has been part of the whole last two and a half, three months is figuring out what I want and me questioning myself, do I still want to sing? Because the last year was very stressful, as Carrie knows, it was a very stressful, hectic, pushing me right to the brink overload burnout mm. and so i i have made a point of questioning do i still want to do this if i were given the opportunity to do anything in the world would i still want to do this and my answer is yes but if not i feel that i have a lot to give in other opportunities in other venues mm. being teaching voice uh being communicating as we are now have you ever thought about doing motivational speech, like being a um, like an influencer, if you will, or a person that gave speeches? Because you yeah. are a beautiful communicator. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you are. I I think, you know, I mean, I was an English major as well in college as as well as uh, things. Here I am. You're interviewing me now, but huh. that it, I I I like I like communicating. I I wrote poetry. I was an English. I had a double major with music and English. So that part of me always likes to talk to people and who knows, you know, I, I think that the biggest thing is that we have to be open right now mm -hmm. to whatever That's and right. not judge it, not criticize it, just accept it. Yes. And you that, know, I wanted to be an English major. I, I fought oh, really? that. With being a music major or an English major, I had a fight. A fight with my inner inner nerdy literature person. <laughs> that's it. See, that's why I've always said in interviews, and Carrie doesn't know this, I've said like, Lisette is the baby me. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> she really is. I've, I've found, I've, I find that that you have, we have so many parallels in our career and it's it's inspiring to see. Oh, thank you. It's yeah, it really is. from my side as well. I, I love that we're getting to know each other, all of us. I know. know each other this way because I find you guys to be such compassionate people. And, you know, it's compassion is something that we always never have enough of. It seems like, you know, people are just even through this virus, you know, people get to a point where they become desperate. I mean, I feel the same way sometimes. I feel like the more desperation creeps in, the more compassion goes away. And it's like you, you want to hang on to compassion while still being desperate <laughs> it's like, how can you do this can i be desperately compassionate <laughs> you can you can i mean so let's do okay in an homage to james lipton actor studio he would ask the same questions at the end okay so we would like to ask you those same questions okay right, All right. Okay, so I wasn't allowed to see these. I, oh God, I'm not prepared. I think we scared her. Okay. I think we did. You want to start? Do you want me to start, Carrie? Uh, you go. What's your favorite word? Sunflower. What is your least favorite word? Moist. <laughs> she would hate our, our prime minister. <laughs> he just came out with speaking moistly. I know I had to use moist multiple times in these classes. And every time I say it, I'm like, mm -hmm. what turns you on? Intelligence. What turns you off? Rudeness. Oh, yes. <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Brainstorms. Ooh. Like thunder and lightning. <laughs> thunder and lightning. in particular. Nice. What sound or noise do you hate? 
Oh God, fucking alarm ringing in the morning. Oh. It, just, oh, it just has to be like the ugliest, the most awful sound. Yes. Ugh. Carrie has to ask the next one though. Oh yeah. What <laughs> is your favorite curse word? Shit. Yes. Yeah, shit. It's actually not the F word. I know that everyone loves the F word because you can put it every which way, but I like the shit out of shit. I do. No poopy. That's <laughs> what, that's why I have that there because I'm a spike. <laughs> Alternative to shit. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? To attempt? Knowing what I know now or if yes. I go back 10 years and start all over? Right now. Okay. Or whatever. Um, anyway. I, I'm, Stephen doesn't like this, but I want to open a vegan restaurant. That, there is no right or wrong answer. I love that. I, I think know. He I, says it's not profitable. It's slave labor and you'll never make any money. And I'm like, I'm going to make money because I'm going to make, I believe I'm going to set. Yeah. I go. Okay, Carrie. Uh, what profession would you not like to do? Anything involving sick people. Ooh. Mm. I cannot, I even, I cry even just when my grandmother had a heart attack. Sorry, I know this is supposed to be fast. My grandmother had a heart attack. I was in the hospital to visit her and I was just like mm -hmm. telling, I was crying just thinking how awful it must be to be a nurse in a hospital. I can't, I couldn't. And the sight of blood for me makes me like go, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the last one, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? I knew I did well with you. <laughs> oh, yay! <laughs> oh, I want to hear welcome. Beautiful. Or like, wait, I think I made a mistake in my accounting. Hold on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I don't know. No, no. What would God, what I'd like to hear versus what would God probably actually say? <laughs> oh, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> you're in the wrong place. You're you're wrong turn. <laughs> you need to go a little south there, Sandra. <laughs> Well, I want your answers to these. I know you got to go. What well, would God hope, say to you? I hope, I hope God says, well, I know, well, I know he's going to let me in because I'm special, but I think oh, when he special. does, I think I am special, but when he does let me in, he's going to be like, girl, the buffet table's over there. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not going to gain a pound. <laughs> I know that's my heaven. I don't know. I mean, Susan Graham's response, I was pretty, oh, because we asked her this one too. It, nah, that guy still makes me cry. Yeah. What did she say? What was it? She said that girl still I makes me cry. can't say it without crying. Oh, well, what'd she say? She said something of like, oh, here's your daddy. Here's like, your daddy. You know, all three of us have lost our dads, so. My yeah. dad's, yes. Here's your dad. Yes. Oh, I my God. Like, oh, I hated her for that. I love you. I wish I could hug you. I <laughs> yeah, I know. Isn't that horrible? It was great, but it was horrible. I was like... <laughs> I don't like you, Susan Graham. <laughs> yeah. Well, but no. My dad's already going to be at the buffet table. So it's that's true. <laughs> that they would be like, pull up a chair. <laughs> yeah. Because I know my dad would be there. He would be like, <laughs> well, eat all I of his food. messages. I, my, I had this weird experience after he died Ooh. on Father's Day, the first Father's Day I ever experienced after he died. And Stephen and I were talking one night and we were saying, you know, how would we communicate with each other from beyond the grave? And Stephen said, I'll leave little hearts for you. Ooh. Hearts. I'll put a heart somewhere and you'll know that that's me. Wow. And it was Father's Day and I was thinking about my dad, you know, and about the dead and the beyond. And I bent down to pick up something off of the floor and the wind somehow showed up and blowed it, blew it away. Blowed it away. Listen to me with my I love English. The wind blowed it on the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a Corona, so. <laughs> I, I went to pick up, it was like a piece of paper or something that had fallen and it, the wind blew it and I followed it Jesus and the wind blew it again. And there was no wind, it was like the door. I don't know, we were inside a room, a bedroom. Yeah. And I followed it finally till I arrived at the corner where my telephone was plugged in and the cord of my phone was shaped like a heart. Like it was like this, it was, a, I don't even know, I can't even replicate it if I tried. It was shaped it. like a heart. Perfect. It was a perfect heart. It was the, and I looked down and it was as prominent as could be. And it was like, I was like, <gasps> cause we had just had this conversation. I was like, okay. No way. And ever since then, when I see a random doesn't belong their heart, it's my dad. Aww. And I see them all the time. It's really kind of amazing. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I believe in it. I honestly do. 
I know some people poo poo it, but I think that the universe is too big to not believe it. You know, I think that if nothing else, it gives us hope and that's what we need right now. So that is a great story to end it with. I mean, oh, really. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks Thank for taking the time. Love you ladies with all my heart. Thank we you. love talking to you and take care of yourselves. And we send all of our love. Okay. And all Thank the best you. with your master class. It's really cool. Yeah. Thanks very much. Sure. Thanks. that instead of are you done yet no, are you fucking done yet my husband boo boo i wish i'm tired i want to get in my pajamas somehow like we're no. <laughs> somehow wearing real clothes for this long today is really exhausting <laughs> okay i'm tired too i'm ready to let the girl i'm free. sorry hmm? i'm ready to let the girls go free mine are like, mine are like mm. Mine is strapped in at a strapless bra. Uh, mine look at a strapless bra and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, yeah, right. You think that's going to hold me up? I don't think so. <laughs> he said, where are you? Mm -hmm. I sent her an email. I texted her too. She's all, right, let's, all right, what do you want to talk about that's fun? What fun can we have? I do want to talk about Agma. I think that's really important. Oh, with her or you and I? No, with her, and I'd like to see what her opinion is on the Nats report. You know, what's so funny is that, like, everybody's in the Nats report, but this shit's already been out there. I'm a reader. I read all this shit. So, I mean, this has already been out. This isn't new news. No. No, I know. I know. It's just Nats kind of compiled it all in one place and put a pretty bow on it and made us all feel like complete crap. 